Welcome to this new adventure about a band that was and is one of a kind, with very inventive ways to play rock and roll, a lot of albums and many hits on charts. This podcast is about the kings of our respected band that has surpassed the lines of time. Every week, listen to this podcast and enjoy it listening as I am doing it by saying it. An underrated band, maybe a very British way to sing songs. Well, yeah. They are from the UK and they have the right to do it. But they did Ray. Ray Davies, Dave Davies, Bill Quaid and Mick Ivory are the founder members of The Kings. My name is Maru Ortiz and let's begin. Hi there, good day, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Whatever time you listen to this, today is a King's Day. Um, how the kings got their music or the music to listen. Back in the day, the big American names who turned written in the early 1930s, like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Coleman Hawkins, Cap Calloway, they do such crowds that in 1935, the British Musicians United provided, prohibited American bands from touring the country, lest they steal the jobs from British performers. This band could remain in force until mid-1950s, and in the meantime, native British talent filled the gap by offering reasonably convincing imitations of the American sound. At the same time, imported American records were slowly becoming available in the shops. Although they were generally too expensive for working-class budgets, aficionados found ways to pool their resources by hosting listening parties or forming rhythm clubs whose members would purchase and dance the latest records. American fields were yet another way to British audiences to hear music directly from across the Atlantic in the years between the end of the war and the arrival of the chief televisions. The heyday of musical production like On the Town, A Star is Born, and Oklahoma, tens of millions of Britons were going to see American movies every week. The Economic underpinnings of this youth culture were full employment, rising wages, and greater access to consumer goods of all kinds. London, which had an employment rate of 1% throughout the 1950s and saw real incomes nearly double from the late 1930s to late 1950s, was the center of this post-war boom, but most other parts of the country prospered as well. New labor-saving devices freed women from age all drugeries, drugeries, giving them the, to spend on more enjoyable activities, lower affair, airfares, and packaged package to brow holiday and brow within the reach of the masses for the first time and cheaper televisions. Founding 85% of reading homes by 1965, brought the war into the into their homes like never before, supermarkets began to muscle aside smaller shops and provide a scale of culinary diversity that was positively designed after 15 years rationing. And the spread of higher purchase system and after 66, the credit card meant that these new market stimulated desires could be graffitied almost instantly. It was thanks to high purchase that Fred Davis could afford to take 12 years old days to sell more musical instruments in Charing Cross Road in 1959 to get his first guitar. A uh, 29 pound harmony meteor for a mere 1.9 pound per week. Such an extravagance would have been unthinkable for a family of a slaughterman's salary before the war. So, uh, in this case, the economy in England was improving due to uh, after the post-war, and the post-war baby boom meant that there were 22 percent more teenagers in Britain. By 1961 and 1951, and in 1960, the termination of compulsory national service meant that boys born after 43 enjoyed much more liberty than ever than even their intimate, immediate elders. Flush with cash and newly liberated in sexual matters, the advent of birth control pill, widely available in 1961, 
these teenagers form a distinct social grouping that was developing its own sets of values, priorities, and tastes. But before being a pop star, Ray Davis earned his gold and as a 15-year-old assistant in the layout department of a trade magazine and they worked in, in the stockroom at Selmer's, the same place where he got his first guitar. When he was around the same age, the style conscious Peter Quaife worked as an art assistant at men's fashion magazines for about a year before the Kings made it big. And prior to joining the band in 1964, drummer Mike Ivory had done nearly every kind of manual labor under the sun, including fireplace marker, maker, snow clearer, and at the time of becoming a king, paraffin delivery man. Particularly if they continued to live at home as Dave Davies did his until his mother caught him in bed with five girls sometime around 1965. These teenagers had more disposable income than any group of working class kids in British history. Overseas relatives, if you have them, might be another source. It was thanks to presents from their sister Renee, who lived for a time in Canada, that Ray and Dave became some of the first Londoners to get hold of Elvis Presley's records in 1956. If you wanted to hear the exciting new sounds coming of out of America, you had either to hear imitation by British artists or to make it yourself. This was the logic behind the skiffle craze in 1960, 1956 and 57, which became the main getaway to American music for innumerable British teenagers, including the, the Kings. Skiffle was uniquely British blend of American blues folk and country music popularized by British jazz bands when they began incorporating songs by black American bluesmen into their sets. So, Skiffle was something utterly new on the British cultural scene, American music that working class teenagers could make themselves. It required neither substantial capital nor outstanding talent to form a Skiffle band. A washboard, an acoustic guitar, and a standing bass made out of an old tea chest and broom handle were sufficient equip equipment and familiarity with few lead valley or josh white songs was sufficient musical training skillful was fast and exciting it spoke of familiar objects usually trains in unfamiliar context usually chicago or the american south and um, for 18 months it was everywhere the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, and Pink Floyd all grew, off, all grew out of this craze. George Harrison credited Skiffle with inspiring him to learn the guitar, and John Lennon's first bar, The Quarrymen, was a Skiffle outfit. Three of the four original kings, Dave, Pete, and Mick, also all known the high play in skiffle bands as teenagers and it's probably no coincidence that Ray Davis received his first guitar toward the end of this craze in 1957. At 13 he was the perfect age to become caught of excitement. It also is likely that skiffle's do-it-yourself ethics helped to inspire Dave's technical inspiration of guitar and amplifiers with his brother-in-law Mike and it's almost certain that Craze helped to lead the Davis brothers into further exploration of American roots music. So in this way, three developments brought American root music and rhythm and blues more really within the grasp, the grasp of British teenagers in 1957 and 58, and one was a decision by the British Musicians Union to seize the restrictions of American musicians during the country. To allow American acts to are written in return to tour Britain in return for an equal number of British acts allowed to into America, American blues musicians had long found ways to evade the ban, but now the door was open to wider array of American musicians, including rhythm and blues acts with harder, more contemporary sound. A second development was the decision by British record labels in the wake of Skiffle, Chris to release the more American blues and rhythm and blues records. In 1958, Pi Records, which would later become the King's label, acquired the rights to recording by artists on the Chess and King's labels in the U.S. and suddenly records by likes of Muddy Waters, Howling Wolf, Bob Dee Lee, Chuck Berry, and Sonny Boy Williamson were much more widely available and before long other British labels were following suit. 
A third important change which had occurred a few years earlier was the Television Act of 1954. This introduced commercial television to rhythm for the first time, opening up the possibility of performance by rock and roll and blues artists outside the restrictive format of the BBC. So by the end of 1957, the gates opened totally. Skiffle had come and gone. Bill Halley and Elvis Presley were on the radio, the former having toured Britain earlier in the year. Television st stations were finally broadcasting teenage music and record shops were filling up with American rock and roll rhythm blues records. And blues records too. Britain even had its own version of Elvis in Vermont's Born Heart Throb Tommy Steele. And more imitators were to come. In this case, Big Brunsey, old-fashioned sound, was one of the reasons he caught Ray Davis' imagination. Although Davis was certainly drawn to the reckless new sound of rock and roll from quite young age, he also showed a strong nostalgic streak, a longing for the, longing for the superbly simpler times of the older generations. Brunsey perfectly combined the contradictory values that Davis could come to embrace in his own music. On the one hand, he was novel, raw, passionate and exciting. He was also American, which automatically made him more thrilling than anything reading could produce. On the other hand, Brunsey was the spokesman for tradition that stretched back in the 19th century, playing an unrefined style of folk music that connected his listeners to a time before radios, televisions, amplifiers, and records. His music was simultaneously old and new, organic and artificial, and from those contradictions came its power. Finally, Bronzy, who died in August 1958, just one month before Low Light and Blue Smoke first appeared on British televisions, was just the beginning of the blues explosion in Britain. It took several years for the Davis brothers to come up with a convincing response to the challenge Big Blue Brunsey had thrown down at that night in Onslow Gardens between 1958 and 1964. As the economy boomed and the London music scene exploded, the brothers began playing separately and together in local bars and dance halls, eventually performing quartet with the neighborhood friend Peter Quife and on bass, uh, Peter Quife on bass and Mike Ivory. From the distant is the mostly in southwest London on drums. They experimented with blues, jazz, rock and roll, and rhythm allure, recording several re undistinguished covers and cycling to such names as the Ray Davis Quartet, the Peter Quaife Quartet, the Vol Weevils, and the Ravens. They finally settled on the Kings in late 1963, and after a couple of failed singles, they hit upon winning formula in August. 1964 with You Really Got Me, a Jack Thunderclap of song that introduced a rough new edge to the British beat movement. The song Ross distorted guitar, prefigured the sounds of heavy metal and punk and gave the Kings a trademark sound that they continue exploring on hit singles like All Day and All The Night and Till The End Of The Day. Soon the Kings were being spoken of in the same breath as the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Manfred Mann and the Animals all of whom had picked up music of Black America and begun to make of its sound and its style that spoke to the unique circumstances of growing up working class in 1916s Britain. So that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe and just click like if you like it. And that will help me to get more audience and obviously to let know more story about this wonderful band called The Kings. <laughs>